And I'm not going to talk about the weather. Oh, you're not going to talk about the weather. Uh, you already have started uh, well, talking about the weather because we're live. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Military and Aerospace Electronics Rapid Fire with John Keller. I am Ernesto Burden, Group Publisher for Military and Aerospace Electronics and Avionics Intelligence, Penwell's Aerospace and Defense Group. And I'm here with John Keller, our Editor-in-Chief, uh, Raconteur-in-Chief, and uh, purveyor of all wisdom that you're going to need to know this week, including, uh, apparently, weather wisdom. John, welcome. How are you? Good. Good. Apparently loquacious today. Uh, yeah. No, I'm just, we're going to try to get to the real stuff. Okay. Well, we will. Uh, I will take your cue then and jump right in. Uh, Raytheon uh, is your first story this week. Uh, you have... Uh, Picked, and that's a Raytheon uh, to move hyperspectral sensor program ACES High forward with potted flight tests. And uh, I should, uh, for those listening uh, who can't see um, the headline that I'm reading, ACES High is spelled uh, all caps A C E S uh, H Y. Uh, ACES High forward with potted flight tests. Go ahead, John. What is this? Well, ACES High. That's a that's a cute short little term for airborne. Queuing and exploitation system hyperspectral. Uh, the interesting thing about it is, you know, there are not very many uh, hyperspectral sensors that are that are getting close to uh, military deployment. I think this one that Raytheon's doing might be the only one, if not one of the few. Hyperspectral sensors are very interesting in that um, they're able to they're able to image things by by thin slicing uh, the electromagnetic spectrum kind of like baloney and they're they're able to take a look at different slices of the electromagnetic spectrum different slices that will reveal different things now with hyperspectral sensors um, you can do things like um, identify a recently disturbed dirt some somewhere where uh, uh, a roadside bomb might be planted. Uh, you can you can uh, see uh, you can see things that might be hiding under foliage, foliage or hiding under camouflage. Once you can slice and dice the electromagnetic spectrum um, in a pretty fine-grained way, there's a lot you can do that. So you can slice. Uh, you can take different looks at the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, put all kinds of sophisticated digital signal processing on there, and you're going to see a lot of things that you've never been able to see before. Now, the interesting thing here is Raytheon's been working on a ACES High for quite a while. That's not that's not new, but um, they're they're uh, you know they're getting ready to uh, take the sensor technology and put it in something like a deployable. Uh, aircraft pod and start uh, start flight testing it uh, under somewhat realistic conditions. So you know, once these flight tests get underway, it's really not going to be very long before uh, uh, before the Air Force uh, can start thinking about uh, deploying these on uh, on aircraft and uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. I believe that uh, it's you know uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that are the primary target but uh, you know once it's once it's out there and ready you could potentially put it on uh, other reconnaissance aircraft uh, tactical fighter aircraft whatever you need out there so and it sounds like based on your story the uh, that not only is this good for detecting uh, the recently disturbed ground and and an IED placement uh, but it all would also be good for detecting uh, the actual uh, Signatures of bomb making materials themselves, so you can uh, you can not only find the final product, but you can find the place where these uh, devices are being manufactured. Oh yeah, I mean so much so much you you would be able to do with hyperspectral sensors, depending on how you set it up and depending on what kind of signal processing you had, you could um, uh, you can do all kinds of things like you know detect trace elements for. Uh, explosives. Uh, you would be able to detect very early on um, uh, chemical, biological agents, things like that. I mean, it's uh, the potential is just terrific. Mm. Amazing. Okay, uh, second story. Uh, the officials at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena have asked the industry for a CubeSat camera that's able to take color images of near-Earth asteroids. Uh, Sounds like hazardous duty. 
Well, it probably is if they were going to send people up there, but that's not the idea. They want to, um, they want to be able to go up and take a color picture of an asteroid. I guess you know they want to, um, you know, get an idea what colors they really are and do all kinds of scientific research. The interesting thing there is, you know, what uh, what NASA has really started to look at for uh, deep space missions is this thing they call a CubeSat and. It's something that, uh, you know, roughly the size of a large softball, maybe something like your uh, desktop phone. You asked if it was maybe the size of a Rubik's Cube. They're not that small yet, I don't think, but eventually they might be. Uh, so NASA is reaching out to industry to try to find, you know, a color camera that can fit on a CubeSat. And the CubeSat, uh, the whole idea is it needs to be no more than one liter in volume, which is really not very big. The camera, I think they want something that's going to take up about half that volume, uh, something that's roughly you know, half a liter in volume, but they want to be able to uh, you know, get mature technology. They want to be able to get a camera that's pretty well ready to go, something that you could put in a CubeSat, launch it, launch it into space, and uh, propel it toward those asteroids that they're interested in, and interested in and go up and start taking pictures. Now, how, how would you say a camera like the one that they're looking for, spec-wise, would compare to a camera like uh, that you might find in the most recent iPhone? I mean, they, these are, we're getting more and more sophisticated cameras in smaller and smaller packages uh, in the consumer electronics goods market. Well, uh, the 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 real the real issue there is that um, a deep space environment is uh, is a far more hazardous and severe environment that your than your shirt pocket is. Um, what they really want is something that will be able to withstand the tremendous shock and vibration of a space launch. Mm -hmm. uh, they want something that's going to be able to withstand uh, the uh, uh, high radiation environment of space. Uh, Areas within Earth orbit are very, very radioactive, and once you get outside of Earth's orbit, you know, into the vacuum of space, you're completely subjected to uh, the sun's radiation uh, with no buffering, no protection that the Earth's atmosphere affords. So you've got shock and vibration, you've got intense radiation environment, and it's got to be something that uh, it's 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 going to work. Uh, they want to send it up to uh, to take a picture of an asteroid. Uh, if it's got a problem, there's no possibility for uh, repairing it. So it's got to be rugged, radiation hardened, uh, and extremely reliable. So you know, I think that's among the reasons that they're looking at a camera that is uh, as large as uh, half a liter in volume, rather than something that's you know no bigger than a than a thimble that goes into your smartphone, but it's it's really got to work and it's got to be high, highly reliable. Mm -hmm. So that's really what's uh, what's at work. And I think the optics, you know, might be a little bit more sophisticated because, you know, when you don't have that many opportunities to send a spacecraft up to an asteroid, you want to get something that's going to be good, something that's going to take the kind of pictures that you want. Yeah. Okay. Last story: uh, the Army is asking the industry for turnkey. 50 kilowatt laser that fits on a, a trailer truck. Uh, well, yeah, now 50 kilowatt laser, that's a very powerful laser. I mean, that's uh, that's that's weapons grade class laser. That can that's capable of destroying a lot of different things. Now, um, it isn't clearly spelled out in this solicitation, but you know, the army the army people in Huntsville that are doing this, they're the same people who are uh, trying to uh, put together a, we a laser weapon that fits on the back of a you know large truck that could be taken onto the battlefield and would protect uh, troops and facilities from things like um, uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, from uh, artillery shells, from mortar rounds. So it's it's something that's it's got to have uh, very precise. Uh, weapons control on it. It's got to be very fast, and it's got to be very reliable. Now, is this particular uh, is this particular laser that the Army is asking for in this particular solicitation? Is it for this weapon? It doesn't say so, but I'm kind of putting two two, two and two together there. Um, the Army already has a, a prime system integrator for this program. It's Boeing, uh, and they've already. Uh, engaged uh, Lockheed Martin Aculite 
to develop, I believe it's a 60 kilowatt uh, fiber laser for this. I think this is something that they're going to be uh, using for research and development and to help refine uh, this laser weapon design. Um, it might be something for uh, more generic, it might not be for actual deployment, but I think it has to do with that laser system and I think that um, uh, this solicitation uh, indicates that that research is moving along and is moving closer to uh, actual deployment. And this is, these were officials, Army officials from uh, the Army Space and Missile Defense Command in Huntsville, right? And so that, that certainly suggests uh, something about uh, what use it might be put to in the future. Well, those, you know, those are the people who are doing this laser weapon. The neat thing about that kind of a laser weapon for the battlefield to take out um, artillery shells, incoming, uh, incoming mortars, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, missiles, that kind of thing is, um, you know, it doesn't run out of bullets. The only thing that it potentially runs out of is power. So uh, you can, uh, and it's something that you would be able to uh, fire uh, at full power for as long as a minute. Uh, and that's that's long enough to take take out potentially a uh, a wealth of targets out there. The interesting thing about it is um, this laser. Uh, they want it to have no more than a 10 minute regeneration period between shots. But if you can fire for 60 seconds and then wait another uh, wait another 10 minutes and then fire again, there's a lot of things you can take out with that. Now, I, we, we didn't, I, I didn't see this in the story, and so this may uh, be a tough question to answer without some research, but I, I can't help asking, what, what's the range on, uh, the potential range on a laser weapon? Well, you know, you've got attenuation through the atmosphere and over distance. I can't answer that question intelligently, but um, in theory, it's going to be able to reach out for many miles, and uh, the idea is it's going to be more than sufficient range uh, to take out, uh, you know, artillery threats, mortar rounds, things like that. Um, you know, it's not it's not built to be extreme long range. It's built to protect troops, trucks, uh, weapon systems, facilities, uh, bases, communication stations, things like that. And for that kind of use, we're talking fairly short range. Yeah, well, even I mean, you said a mile or two. Gosh, even that seems like long range for a, a, an energy weapon. Well, it uh, things things are getting very interesting out there on the laser laser weapons front. No so kidding. Lot, yeah, there's a lot we're going to start seeing. Well, and that that actually brings me to the last question, which is something that we talked about just before we started the uh, the broadcast, and that is, we hear and read a lot about laser weapons being developed right now. But I had asked you uh, offline, what's actually out there in terms of active functioning laser weapons? Well, there's not a lot of actual deployed functioning laser weapons yet, but there's a lot that's close. The Army's working on this uh, on this laser weapon. Uh, the Navy uh, is getting ready to deploy a laser weapon, I believe, on uh, uh, something like an amphibious transport dock uh, fairly soon. The Navy really wants laser weapons for taking out things like unmanned vehicles, um, uh, anti-ship missiles, and particularly swarms of uh, small boats that uh, the terrorists might be using. Um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be very effective for that. And so, what's out there right now today? Not too much, but you know, within a year, maybe less, uh, we're going to have we're going to start seeing lasers on uh, uh, surface warships. We're going to start seeing them, seeing them on the battlefield. And once that gets started, I think you're going to start seeing laser weapons everywhere. Once again, it's a big deal because they don't run out of bullets. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, I'd like and thank everybody for watching. I'd like to uh, remind you all that you can read uh, these stories and see some illustrations with them of the things that we were talking about at militaryaerospace.com, and uh, and we will hope to see you there. Thank you very much.